Well, hi, this is Ray Mossolder. And I'm about to tell you some things I bet you didn't know. I sure didn't know them until I learned them from one of the most learned men who exists on this planet today, Bill Keith. And uh, I see I need to straighten my hat, my journalistic hat. Do I look like a journalist? I am. Chapter six, who's in charge? As America staggers down a crooked road, sometimes I wonder who's char in charge when Homeland Security distributes taxpayer cash for bingo, limousine service, and other non-security related projects. Bingo. Busy airport security screeners fail to detect fake bombs in security testings. A nuclear warhead is mistakenly loaded on a board on board a B-52 bomber without the knowledge of the pilot or crew. Nuclear plant guards are caught sleeping. Sabotage, drinking, reported at NASA. There is a drunken brawl at the U.S. operated research facility in Antarctica. Federal spending to rebuild the city of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina is a disaster. There are reports of lax and lazy security at the Los Alamos nuclear weapons laboratory. Imprisoned sex offenders receive thousands of dollars in federal grants. The U.S. Treasury Department plans to send $496.5 million to the Palestinian Authority now controlled by the Hamas terrorists committed to the destruction of Israel. When I hear of failures like this, I wonder if the federal government is out of control or so large and encumbered with bureaucratic red tape that it is unmanageable. We see government blunders and mismanagement everywhere. A survey of Homeland Security grants to state and local governments is quite revealing and disturbing. Some of the money went to purchase a bus to provide for a bingo hall and a limousine service, according to a report from the Heritage Foundation. The report also revealed that the security funds were used to build a homeless shelter and to fund a program to locate missing persons. Now, what does a bingo hall or a limousine service and the other projects have to do with Homeland Security? And again, I ask, who's in charge and how could this happen? Now, I'll admit it's a good deal for some of our citizens. Now, if terrorists detonate a bomb in their city, it will undoubtedly shut down the bingo game. But the politicians will have a bus and a limousine to get them out of town. Obviously, Homeland Security officials do not agree with the report. Why does that not surprise me? Now, for some more exciting news. Several years ago, two of our nation's busiest airports, Los Angeles International and O'Hare in Chicago, failed to locate fake bombs during a screening sting. The bombs were carried under several airplanes by undercover federal agents posing as passengers. Screeners at the Los Angeles airport missed about 75 
percent of simulated explosives and bomb parts the agents hid under their clothes or in carry-on bags at various checkpoints. Security at O'Hare was also disappointing, and the failure rate stunned the experts. Terrorists bringing a homemade bomb on an airplane or bringing on bomb parts and assembling them in the cabin is the top threat against aviation. Thomas Frank of USA Today reported Homeland Security's response, and it was typical. They are trying to find better methods to protect the public, whatever that means. Thankfully, they now have instituted far better security checkpoints at all of our major airports. A B-52 bomber mistakenly loaded with five advanced cruise missiles with nuclear warheads flew from Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. The pilot and crew didn't have a clue that they were carrying the dangerous warheads. Michael Hoffman of the Military Times reported that since the warheads were not discovered until the B-52 landed at Barksdale, they were unaccounted for during the three-and-a-half-hour flight. Of course, when I heard about the incident, I wondered what would have happened if the B-52 had crashed somewhere along the route from North Dakota to Louisiana. A cr excuse me, a crash could ignite the high explode. Excuse me. Must have been something I ate. Or maybe it's the bad digestion that's going on while I share this report. It's enough to give you indigestion. Now, an Air Force spokesman said a crash could ignite the high explosives associated with the warhead and possibly cause a leak of the plutonium but the warhead's elaborate safeguards would prevent a nuclear detonation from occurring. Well, I sure hope so. Oh, there's more. Have you ever heard of the Peach Bottom nuclear plant in Pennsylvania? It's one of America's largest. CBS News reported that several security guards at the plant went to sleep on the job. And CBS said the area, this is a quote, the area where the guards were taped uh, sleeping on different shifts and days is called the ready room. The sleeping guards are supposed to be poised to spring into action immediately if there is an emergency. I take that to mean that the guards are to be on alert in case there's a nuclear meltdown or a so-called China syndrome. However, a spokesman for Exelon Nuclear, operator of Peach Bottom, said the sleeping guards did not, quote, impact safety and security of the plant. Really? I'm sure that that was a great relief to the Pennsylvania people living near the plant. I guess good help is hard to find these days. Did you hear the story about the NASA astronaut charged with attempted murder in a bizarre love triangle? Astronaut Lisa Marie Nowak was accused of attempting first degree murder in a bizarre attack on a romantic rival for a space shuttle pilot's affections. Nowak, a Navy captain, was a 43-year-old mother of three. According to a police report, Nowak drove 900 miles to confront Colleen Shipman, a woman she believed was trying to win the affections of Navy Commander William 
Oifelin, an unmarried fellow astronaut. When she learned that Shipman had planned a trip to Orlando, Florida, Nowak followed her. Nowak, according to Fox News, raced from Houston to Orlando wearing diapers in the car so that she wouldn't have to stop to go to the bathroom. During space flights, astronauts wear diapers during lunch and re-entry. According to police, when Noak arrived in Orlando, she went to the airport to wait for Shipman's plane to arrive. She was wearing a wig and a trench coat. And then Noak followed Shipman to her car where she attacked her. Shipman survived and was able to call the police. And when they arrived, they found a steel mallet, a four inch folding knife, a can of chemical spray, and $600 in a bag that Nowak was carrying. Nowak is a graduate of the US Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, and has a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. She flew to the International Space Station in July of 2006 aboard the space shuttle Discovery. She was charged with attempted kidnapping, burglary, and assault and battery. She entered a guilty plea to a lesser charge and she received a year's probation. There were two other reports out of Cape Canaveral that shook the foundations of the space agency. One involved claims that astronauts were drunk before flying. Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press reported. In the other was news from NASA itself that a worker had sabotaged a computer set for delivery to the International Space Station. Now, apparently on two occasions, astronauts were allowed to fly even though flight surgeons and other astronauts said they were drunk and a safety hazard. At a news conference, Bill, and I'm going to murder this name, I know, Gersten Mayer. Well, that's pretty close. At a news conference, Bill Gersten Mayer, NASA's space operations chief, was asked repeatedly about the drunken astronaut report. And he replied he'd never seen an intoxicated astronaut before a flight. But Kirsten Meyer confirmed the computer sabotage. He revealed that an employee for a NASA subcontractor had cut the wires in a computer that was about to be loaded into the shuttle Endeavor for a launch. The operations chief declined to identify the worker, the subcontractor, or where the incident took place. He said the computer did not pose a safety problem and that it would be repaired. Those of us who were eyewitnesses to the rise of NASA and the work of our heroic astronauts always looked on them with great pride. Have we now witnessed the rise and fall of this great institution? I hope not. Christmas always brings out the best in some people and the worst in others. Two members of an Antarctic-based staff were evacuated to Christchurch, New Zealand from the most remote research facility after a drunken brawl according to the independent British newspaper, Guardian Unlimited. The fight took place at the U.S. operated station located in the heart of the frozen continent, where scientists carry out a range of investigations from astrophysics to seismology. And the nonsense goes on 
and on. There was a serious security breach at Los Alamos, the nation's premier nuclear weapons laboratory in New Mexico. First, we learned of a leak of highly classified information on the internet. Later, a worker took his laboratory laptop computer with additional sensitive information on a vacation to Ireland, where it was stolen from his hotel room, according to John Barry of Newsweek. And Barry reported it has not been recovered. Hillary may want to use that if she ever goes to trial to say, well, look at John Barry. Oh, <laughs> it wouldn't be John Barry. John Barry was the uh, guy that reported this in Newsweek. Another breach at the same lab involved a scientist who worked in the experimental physics division involved with weapons design. It occurred when he sent an email containing secret information to employees at a Nevada test site over the internet rather than through an, an internal secure network. And of course, anyone could access the information. These incidents come as Los Alamos is still reeling from the revelation that in January 2007, half a dozen board members of the company that manages the lab circulated over the internet an email to each other containing information about the composition of America's nuclear arsenal. So what do we hear from Los Alamos officials? The purported incident is under investigation. It would be inappropriate to comment. Typical bureaucratic doublespeak. The Associated Press has reported that dangerous sex offenders receive thousands of taxpayers' dollars to take college courses by mail. Across the nation, dozens of sexual predators have been taking higher education classes at taxpayer expense while confined by the courts to treatment centers, wrote Ryan J. Foley for the Associated Press. Critics say they are exploiting a loophole to receive Pell Grants, the nation's premier financial aid program for low-income students. Foley said that even though prison inmates and students convicted of drug offenses are not eligible for the Pell Grants, sexual predators can lawfully receive the grants if they are transferred from prisons to state or federal institutions for treatment. And of course, the drug users, thank you, Mr. Obama, uh, more and more of them are just being released from prison. Said Representative Rick Keller of Florida, who in 2008 said he wants to stop the practice. This is the most insane waste of taxpayer money that I've seen in my eight years in Congress. Uh, it's a national embarrassment that we are wasting taxpayer dollars for pedophiles and rapists to take college courses while hardworking young people from lower class families are flipping hamburgers to pay for college or can't go at all. Officials at some of the treatment centers have reported the sex offenders have used the Pell Grant funds to purchase DVD players, CDs, and clothing after they have dropped out of school. 
The institutions and government do not keep count of how much money sexual predators receive, Foley said. The maximum Pell Grant is $4,310 per year. The government generally sends payments to colleges for tuition, and any leftover is sent to the student to cover expenses. Here are some examples of the predators receiving taxpayer funds. In early 2008, six predators at the Sand Ridge Treatment Center in Wisconsin were receiving Pell Grants and others at that institution, and they received the grants, had received the grants in the past. Sand Ridge administrators said some of the predators used the money for living expenses already being provided by the taxpayers of Wisconsin. In Iowa, 14 convicted sexual predators at the Cherokee Mental Health Institute have received grants during the past few years. However, nine of them dropped out of the program after receiving the government taxpayer funds. In California, several of the predators living at the Colinga State Hospital are receiving government funds but a representative of the institution said they have no way of determining how many or how much they receive. Wouldn't that be snooping? Some members of Congress say it would be wrong to stop the predators from receiving the grants since they help in the rehabilitation of the predators. I'll just bet. Back closer to home, Congress exercises certain jurisdictional authority over Washington, D.C., but has never done a very good job. Some areas of the city look like a war zone. The most recent congressional failure is the use of tax dollars to provide clean needles to drug addicts in the city. Officials will spend $1 million dollars on the program in an effort to reduce the AIDS epidemic. Now on the surface, that sounds like a good program, but let's take a closer look. The fund subsidizes bad behavior, both immoral and drug related. We found out the word illegal has no real meaning. Just look at the border. Gary Bauer, president of American Values, questions the program since there's no available research to indicate that it will be successful. The problem is not dirty needles. The problem is unprotected sex, Bauer says. The problem is that large numbers of people in urban areas continue to engage in behavior that is guaranteed to spread disease. He also says the program subsidizes bad behavior, intravenous drug usage, and the homosexual lifestyle, and that it is outrageous that the government is subsidizing that kind of immorality. You know, th there are times when I wonder if there is any common sense left in Washington. For instance, our government has given hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinians, a bloodthirsty gang committed to wiping Israel off the face of the earth, according to columnist Linda Chavez, writing for the Jewish World Review. Chavez rightly points out that we should have learned a lesson from the American experience that handouts do not work. Rather, they become a crutch 
and they create a permanent underclass dependent on government, exactly what Donald Trump is saying right now. At least American welfare recipients weren't using the cash to build bombs to blow up their neighbors, Chavez wrote in a commentary entitled Palestinian Handouts. The same can't be said of Palestinians who have received Western aid. Israelis have found a bomb-making factory in the West Bank town of Nablus. Chavez also says the Palestinians have built a culture based on hate, and this country shouldn't give them another dime until Hamas and Fatah quit fighting among themselves and trying to destroy Israel. In 2008, the United States planned to give $496.5 million to the Palestinian Authority controlled by Hamas terrorists. Of that amount, $410 million is for development programs, an additional $86.5 million for security training of Palestinians by the CIA. Since 1994, the CIA has armed and trained thousands of the security forces, and many of them later joined various Palestinian terrorist organizations. CIA Palestinian training success is best described by a member of the PA's own security unit for 17, Officer Abu Yusuf. Quote, the operations of the Palestinian resistance would not have been so successful and would have not have killed more than 1,000 Israelis and defeated the Israelis in Gaza without American military training. He boasted that, Abu Yusuf. Apparently, there's no way for the United States to ensure the Palestinians use American millions of dollars for humanitarian purposes. It's not tracked. In March 2007, the Palestinian Authority Prime Minister and former World Bank official Salam Fayyad told London's Daily Telegraph, no one can give donors that assurance that funds reach their designated destinations. Hence, no one, including the State Department of the United States, knows for sure how much of this country's aid to the Palestinians winds up in the hands of the terrorists. Perhaps some of the American dollars goes to Al-Aqsa television, an anti-Israeli, anti-American station the telecast Tomorrow's Pioneers, a children's program. The station once featured a sued the rabbit who told the young kids watching the program, we would annihilate the Jews. They also presented a puppet show that features a valiant young Palestinian boy who breaks into the White House in Washington, D.C., and kills the American president, but not before making him beg for his life. You know, I get quite indignant when I realize that taxpayer dollars are funding that kind of foolishness. Oh, sure, we have the secular progressives in the Jimmy Carter-esque tradition telling us that all we have to do is sit down with Hamas and other terrorist-oriented groups, shake their hands, and everything will be all right. Someone should stand up and say, enough is enough. But no one seems to think it's that important. 
perhaps because they aren't spending their own money in helping the Palestinians kill Jews. They're, spend, they're spending our money. Our government is woefully inept, and nowhere is that any more evident than in the efforts to restore New Orleans and the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina. Representative Tancredo once said it is, quote, time the taxpayer gravy train left the New Orleans station and called for an end to federal aid to the area that was devastated in 2005. There are reports that the federal government has spent $161 billion, that's billion with a B, to rebuild much of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. Tancredo pointed out that an estimated $1 billion, billion with a B, has been wasted through fraud and abuse in the recovery program. All of us were astounded when we learned that the trailer houses provided by the Federal Emergency Management Administration for homeless Katrina refugees were toxic and making the people sick and some died. Now, Amanda Spake wrote in The Nation, along the Gulf Coast, in towns and fishing villages, from New Orleans to Mobile. Survivors of Hurricane Katrina are suffering from a constellation of similar health problems. Amanda wrote, they wake up wheezing, coughing, and gasping for breath, their eyes blurry, their heads ache, they feel tired, lethargic, nosebleeds are common, as are some infections and asthma attacks. Children and seniors are most severely affected, but no one is immune. What caused the problem? The 102,000 travel trailers and mobile homes purchased by FEMA are built with composite wood and particle board and other components that emit formaldehyde, a toxic chemical, according to Spake. After the devastation, some 275,000 homeless people were living in the trailers that cost taxpayers nearly three billion, that's billion with a B, dollars. Formaldehyde is a powerful irritant and when inhaled constricts breathing passages. It's been classified as a carcinogen. I know I murdered that word. Isn't it funny? Sometimes I'll come across a word and I think, how do you say it? And I'm thinking of it real quick because I can see it coming out. It's carcinogen. There we go. Good going, Ray. <laughs> Bad going, FEMA. FEMA knew for more than a year, for more than a year, that the trailers were toxic before they started moving people out of the trailers. Again, I ask, who's in charge? Reverend Jesse Lee Patterson, a black writer with a passion for the truth, says there have been myriad misconceptions about the recovery program pawned off on the American people by agenda-driven politicians, the frantic news media, desperate to criticize President George W. Bush, and by race hustlers. Peterson points out that although government officials in Washington, 
we're responsible for the toxic trailers fiasco. The people of New Orleans and their leaders must take the blame for many of the problems after Katrina. If you're black and a hurricane is about to destroy your city, then you'll probably wait for the government to save you, Peterson said. When 75% of New Orleans residents had left the city, it was primarily welfare pampered blacks that stayed behind and waited for the government to bail them out. According to Peterson, men like Reverend Jesse Jackson and Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan condemned the racist President George W. Bush for the fiasco in New Orleans after Katrina. Farrakhan, according to Peterson, again, a, a blank writer who tells it like it is. Peterson said Fran Farrakhan actually proposed the idea that the government blew up the levee so as to kill blacks. But he believes that if Farrakhan and Jackson were really serious about blaming government, they should blame the city of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana. Peterson said responsibility to perform legally and practically fell first on the mayor of New Orleans. We are now familiar with Mayor Ray Nagan, who likes to yell at President Bush for failing to do Nagan's job. The Washington Times reported that Nagan even failed to follow the city's emergency response plan, which pointed out that thousands of the city's poorest people would have no way to evacuate the city during a hurricane. According to Peterson, there were ways to evacuate the poor. We have a photographic evidence showing 200 park school buses unused and underwater. Peterson said, how much planning does it require to put people on a bus and leave town? Instead of launching an evacuation, Mayor Negan crowded tens of thousands of people into the Superdome and the city's convention center. After only three days, those facilities became ghettos, rampant with theft, rape, and murder. Well, these are only a few of the hundreds of examples of the paralysis that plagues federal government. And although there are some voices calling for reform, it may be too little too late. We the people elect a president, vice president, senators and congressmen who are supposed to be looking out for our interests. And yet there's a cavalier attitude about handling our tax dollars that defies description as liberal Democrats and marshmallow Republicans. Think of hundreds of ways to spend the money. We loan them. Now, welcome to the world of waste. Missing funds, government employee credit card embezzlement, student loans for fictitious students attending fictitious colleges, fraudulent government research, uncollected airplane ticket refunds and massive program duplication. Total, are you ready for it? Total $100 billion a year. That's billion with a B. And that's the word from a study by the Heritage Foundation. By the way, if you're giving money, don't give it to the Republican Party. Give it to Judicial Watch, Her the Heritage Foundation. These are great groups. 
Jay Sekulow and the uh, and Family Research Council with Tony Perkins. They're doing marvelous work. Give to them, but not to a party. Because if you give it to the party, they're just going to have a party. Um, it makes me want to shout, does anyone care about us little guys who are paying the bills? In 2003, the Treasury Department reported that $24.5 billion was missing. That's billion with a B. And uh, these are funds for which the government auditors can't account. The government knows that $25 billion was spent by someone somewhere on something, but auditors do not know who spent it, where it was spent, or on what it was spent, the Heritage Foundation reported. According to Heritage, an audit revealed that during one five-year period, the Department of Defense alone purchased and then left unused about 270,000 commercial airline tickets at a cost of $100 million. Auditors also found 27,000 transactions where the Pentagon paid two times for the same ticket. Even worse, the Pentagon never bothered to get a refund for these fully refundable tickets. There was another very remarkable practice concerning the airline tickets. The Pentagon purchased, purchased tickets for their employees and then for some unknown reason, reimbursed the employees for the cost of the same tickets. In one case, an employee would allegedly made seven false claims for airline tickets purchased not to have noticed that $9,700 was deposited into his or her account. The report said these additional transactions cost taxpayers $8 million. The Pentagon announced it would build a new 18-hole golf course. You know, that's necessary. I mean, suppose that one of the bombers, let's say, from North Korea or from Russia, it goes over where the Pentagon is. If they have a golf course, it, it, they could drop the hydrogen bomb right in one of the holes. You know, that would be fun to see if they could get a hole in one. Oh, that wouldn't be fun? You're right. The Pentagon announced it would build a new 18-hole golf course near the Andrews Air Force Base in suburban Maryland at a cost about $5 million. However, Golf Digest reported that they were already nine, there were already 19 military golf courses around Washington, D.C. Oh, what fun. You go, you go from one to the next. Then there is the case of embezzled funds at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA. The department issued federal credit cards to their employees to purchase job-related materials to be paid for by the agency. But large numbers of those employees abused the credit card privilege. A recent audit revealed that employees diverted millions of dollars to personal purchases 
through their government-issued credit cards. The report said sampling 300 employees' purchases over six months, investigators estimated that 15% abused their government credit cards at a cost of $5.9 million. Taxpayer funds were used for tickets to an Ozzy Osbourne rock concert, for tattoos, for lingerie, for car payments, cash advances, and even, get ready for this, tuition to bartender school. Well, not, you and I agree, don't you, that that's good money spent by the Pentagon and by the Department of Agriculture. Certainly, they need to know how to bartend. Taxpayer funds were used for tickets. Oh, I said that. Department officials have pledged a thorough investigation. Oh, yeah. They are so great with their investigations that go nowhere. But following the missing dollars may prove to be quite elusive. There are 55,000 credit cards in circulation, including 1,549 in the hands of former employees who no longer work at the USDA. Boy, I gotta get a job with the federal government, don't you? The Agriculture Department also spent a billion dollars in farm payments to more than 170,000 dead people over a seven-year period, according to congressional investigators. The Defense Department also uncovered a credit card scandal during one recent 18-month period, Air Force and Navy personnel used government-funded credit cards to charge at least 102000 uh, no, $102,400, that's it, for admission to entertainment events, $48,250 for gambling, $69,300 for cruises. This is our defense department. And $73,950 for exotic dance clubs and prostitutes. That's from the Heritage Foundation. They are doing a great work finding out these things. I hear from them regularly and from Tony Perkins and from Jay Sicklow and, uh, and they're not, they don't know me from a bean. I did one time uh, argue before the Texas Supreme Court with Tony Perkins uh, in the late nineties. And I did know Jay Sicklow when from the days of being at the Seven Under Club as a marriage seminar teacher. But the other's heritage uh, and uh, judicial watch. These are great organizations. And if anybody's going to get to the top of things, they will. That's true even in the Hillary Clinton case. And, of course, James Comey is, I think, doing a great job with the FBI investigation. I want to say just one thing about that. We'll go back to Bill here. But uh, I think that's very important. If people are saying it's too slow, I mean, she's going to get the nomination and then what? And part of it has been Loretta Lynch and the way that the State Department uh, has run things, the Attorney General blocking things, but that's been released now. 
So what will happen? It, it, why did they have to be so thorough? Because both Hillary and Bill Clinton are lawyers. And boy, are they sharp. And they have other lawyers that are surrounded, have surrounded them. Uh, auditors discovered, let's see, I want to get, I've got to get back in this. I'm sorry, I lost my track. Taxpayer funds. Oh, I've read that. Sorry, Bill, <laughs> when I do this kind of thing, but really the people do hang on, and I do so thank you for hanging on. Um, however, Medicare overspending is one of the most corrupt of all federal programs. <laughs> when you say that, Bill, I think, golly, I've been reading this chapter and I'm mortified by what our government has done. Do you think we need somebody in there that's going to straighten things? And that's Donald Trump's promise. Um, I'm not, I haven't endorsed him. I will if he wins the nomination. I don't, I'll endorse anybody there. I, well, I'm going to take that back because I am going to go independent. Well, forget it. I'm just mumbling. Auditors discovered that Medicare pays as much as eight times what other federal agency pay for the same drugs and the same medical supplies. Eight times more. Medicare paid an average of more than double what the Veterans Administration paid for the, the same items. However, inflated prices for drugs are not the most expensive examples of Medicare waste. Basic payment errors, the results of deliberate fraud and administrative errors, cost $12.3 billion annually. That's billion with a B. It, it, again, going back to Donald Trump. It, where do you think he would get the money to do all of the infrastructure and all of the rest of what he is promising? Do you think there's a few billion dollars, billion going to trillion that he could use if he stopped this fraud? And do you really, really, really think Hillary Clinton will stop this? Or Bernie Sanders will stop this? Basic payment errors. The results of deliberate fraud and administrative errors cost $12.3 billion annually, the auditor said. As much as, that's annually. $12.3 billion annually. As much as $7 billion owed to the program has gone uncollected or has been written off. I mean, what's a few dollars here and there? Putting it all together, Medicare reform could save taxpayers and program beneficiaries $20 billion to $30 billion, both with a B, annually, without reducing benefits. Some estimate that amount that amount in 2010 has escalated to $50 billion annually. It'd be really worth checking now to see what that cost is. There's also significant waste and graft in the Department of Education, particularly as it relates to funding fictitious students at fictitious 
colleges. For instance, the department received applications for student loans from three students to attend the IECA Institute in London, England. The department approved the applications and disbursed $55,000. The education department administrators overlooked one problem. Neither the IECA Institute nor the three students who received $55,000 existed. Again, it was the Heritage Report that said the fictitious college and students were created on paper by congressional investigators to test the verification procedures. Recent studies reveal that nearly $22 billion, billion with a B, in student loans have never been paid back to the department. And that one, I, my gosh, with the government grafting all over the place, that one I can look at and say, okay, just forgive the debt. I would love to see that done. Does anything shock the American people these days? Have we become so accustomed to being ripped off that graft and fraud no longer even bother us? Or have we been inoculated against the anger that should result from bad government behavior? This is America, folks. Now, let's look at, and, and I'm just about finished. So is the government, unless it changes its ways. Now, let's look at some other outrageous cases of government waste. The government spent nearly $20 million on the International Fund for Ireland, whatever that is, for projects including pony trekking, riding across country on ponies, and golf videos. Congressmen always look out for themselves. I mean, they, they have fully automated push-button elevators on Capitol Hill, but they continue to spend thousands annually to have attendants push the buttons for them. The Pentagon and Central Intelligence Agency channeled some $11 million to psychics who might provide a, a special insight about various foreign threats. Thomas A. Schatz of Citizens Against Government Waste, another good group, reported that was the disappointing Stargate program. Since the bureaucrats in Washington are playing with our money, there are more wild spending schemes that anyone can even imagine. The Social Security Administration spends $25 billion a year, that's billion with a B, on supplemental security income. Now, studies reveal Thousands of men and women in prison receive social security insurance checks related to their alleged disabilities. In Denver, $160,000 was sent to several recipients as their official address, which was a local tavern. A San Francisco drug addict used his SSI income to buy drugs to sell to other addicts on the street for a profit. Estimates suggest that as many as 79,000 79, alcoholics and drug addicts in the land of America receive SSI benefits. That's about $360 million each year. And they spend the money 
on their habits. That's 79,000 alcoholics and drug addicts that are taxpayer money supports so that they don't have to work. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.